characteristic of clean code is it's cared for, it's maintained. Now this is also a byproduct of writing clean code. You get software that is easier to maintain. You get software that people are willing to maintain because you've taken the time to nurture the code as opposed to just writing a solution and pushing it out the door. I'm guilty of doing that. Like I said, over a decade, I've pushed out a lot of very dirty, dirty code. Now, clean code is also efficient. It's done right. Uh, there's an expression that my mom used to use uh, that says, whether the job is big or small, do it right or not at all. So the point here is, when you're writing clean code, or when you're writing software, you should aim to have a final product that takes as little of a path, as short of a path, to accomplish the goal. It's efficient. It reads well. So this is, these are building on each other. That is done right. Software is done right when you can read it, when it is very short. That's, that's a theme that you'll see, especially if you read Clean Code Book. There's a, a fascination with methods, functions that are two or three lines. So it's not really an important metric to keep track of, but just keep in mind that the more efficient your code is, the cleaner it is. Clean code is also extensible. So as you're writing your software, cleaner code is gonna be able to solve a problem of tomorrow. So it's gonna be something that you can, you can easily maintain. So this goes back to that whole point of it's cared for. Notice how these, these, these characteristics of clean code are all kind of interconnected. There isn't one piece that you can say, I'm gonna go out tomorrow and write extensible code. But what this means is, your code should be able to be modified, or your code should be able to deal with new situations that arise very quickly. That's part of the efficiency. You've got something you can easily read, so you can easily modify it to solve a new problem that crops up. So clean code is also extensible. And finally, and probably the most important aspect of what clean code is, is simple. Clean code should be as simple as possible. It's something that you should be able to easily figure out both what it's doing and how it's doing it. This goes back to naming things appropriately. This goes back to writing efficient code. Clean code should always be simple. Now, as developers, we like processes. We like uh, lists. A lot of people like a process list to say, how can I accomplish clean code? How can I get clean code into my workflow? Well, I'm going to give you two rules of clean code. And the first one is don't talk about clean code. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Violating that one right now, right? Uh, so the first rule of clean code is write dirty code first, then clean it. That may sound contradictory, but the point is, as you're developing software, you're going to write a solution. I call it banging out a solution. You've got a ticket in. You say, all right, I know how to do this. You write 400 lines, 300 lines, whatever it is, gets the job done, and you say, I'm done. Commit it, push it, and deploy it. The rule of clean code is you should write that dirty code. That's perfectly fine. But then you should look at it, try to understand it, try to figure out how you can clean it. So you are not going to be able to write clean code. No, I don't know of anyone who can sit down and say, who can figure out all of the names, who can figure out all of the interactions of their code the very first time they sit down to solve a problem. So that is a rule. You are not going to be able to do it. So write your code, write your dirty code, then clean it. Your first pass at solving a problem is not going to be your best code. That should be a natural progression. And this is why there's other topics or other books that talk about the idea of craftsmanship or the idea of writing good software, and they'll say something along the lines of, getting the job done is great, but you should write your, your solution, then discard it, write it again. This is the concept of, it kind of plays into the concept of what code katas are all about, but the idea is repetition is gonna help you see clarity. So your first pass, you can probably discard it. I wouldn't suggest it, probably your boss isn't gonna be too happy about you saying, well, I've solved this problem five times. But look how clean it is. <laughs> or maybe your boss will, I don't know. If I was your boss, I'd be proud of you. Uh, but you have to keep that in mind as you're writing stuff. So you write the code, you can clean it up, 
you write the code, maybe you can discard it. So it's a judgment call for you. And finally, the key to actually attain, obtaining clean code, or actually attaining the, the idea of writing clean software, is successive refinement. So that's where the refactoring side of this comes in. So the clean code is the goal. The refactoring is the process that gets us towards that goal. The second rule of clean code is leave the code cleaner than you found it. This is a big one that a lot of people skip. They're working on something and they, they say, oh, I'm solving the problem. They solve the problem. They don't fix any code around it. They don't fix any methods that it interacts with. They don't fix any problems that they see. They just look at it. So this particular rule was, of course, shamelessly borrowed from the Boy Scouts of America, who say, leave your campground better than you found it, and maybe some other, some other ways to express this. But you don't want to walk into a problem, look at code, say, it's already dirty. I can go ahead and just add my solution and be done with it. You want to write your solution into the code, then clean your code as well as the code around it that you've touched. Now, this doesn't mean you open a file, you open a class that has 15 methods, you're changing one line in one of those methods, it doesn't mean go through and clean the entire file. That would be painful, if nothing else. All it means is clean around what you're working on. Clean the naming. If you see something that was confusing to you, it's probably confusing to someone else. Change the name. It's not that hard. Incremental changes are the way that you get to this cleaner code concept. So this is the same same point of successive refinement. You're not going to make things overnight. You're not going to make one commit that's going to fix your code base and take, take you from a dirty pile of code into a clean, sparkly, shiny piece of code. You're not going to make a diamond overnight, right? And then finally, even if the only change that you're going to make is cosmetic, you're maintaining clean code. You're helping to get your, your teammates. You're helping to get yourself, if you're the only person working on the project, you're helping to get your project towards cleaner code, even if it's just a cosmetic change. So changing a variable name from account to to account we're modifying or account modified or whatever, whatever naming makes sense for the particular area that you're working, that's a good change. That is an incremental change that's going to get you closer to writing clean software. So let's dive into a brief example. Now, this example takes one very, very crucial thing for granted. If you're going to get involved in this process, you should have tests. Not should, you must have tests. Refactoring is something you don't want to change software, even sometimes even cosmetically, without tests. So this is not a testing talk, so I'm not going to delve into how we write tests for this code. I'm going to assume that this code already has tests in place. So the refactoring that we're doing is just changing the actual production code and then running the test to make sure that our change didn't break anything. So remember that step in between every single change that you make, run the test. If they fail, you broke something. Step back, fix it. So here's our example. We've got, and this is a bit of a contrived uh, example, but this is typical of what you'd see in some sort of service layer or database interaction layer. Uh, of code. In our case, we've got accounts in our system. And we've got this account service object, which has a find method. Now, if you can look at this really quickly, how many, how many return values might come out of this code? Can anyone tell me? Two, one, three, three, three and an exception? Okay. So, the point is, it's ki you can kind of catch the flow, but it's not immediately obvious what's going on. You have to go through and read count if statements, try to figure out how many different return values you can get. So I would call this dirty code. I would call this something that is on my radar for refactoring. So I may look at it and see a big problem with this particular piece of code is these nest nested if statements. These are kind of throwing the readability down for me. They're, they're taking the story and kind of throwing it away. So I don't really get a flow from reading these statements. I see a nested if block, if else block in here, and then I've got one out on the outside. So the first bit of refactoring we might, we might want to look at involves these if statements. 
Now, some people will tell you that there's rules around figuring out if this needs to be refactored. They may tell you to count the levels of nesting and figure out if it's two or greater, you should refactor. Or if it's one, it's okay. Or if it's two, it's okay. There's different people have different opinions. I personally don't place any value in this idea of looking at a metric like that and figuring out, yes, I need to refactor this because it is two levels deep. I think if it's two levels deep and the, and the code makes sense to me and it's readable and it's not causing problems, I don't necessarily have to refactor it. So I, do, I, I check things on a case-by-case -case basis and I suggest everyone else does the same. So the first bit of refactoring that we're gonna, we're gonna undertake is when you have a significant number of nested conditions or when you have nested conditions that are interrupting the readability of your code, you can refactor them to be more understandable by using guard clauses. Now, if you're not familiar with a guard clause, it's essentially an if statement that tests a condition and then takes some action based on that, usually returning a value or throwing an exception or that sort of thing. It's basically testing a precondition for your, for your uh, code. Now, looking back at the code where we're going to refactor, I can already see a guard clause here. It's just reverse of what I would expect to see out of a guard clause. In this case, we're testing a positive condition. If the ID passed in is a string, and its string length is 36, that's our positive condition. If it's not, we're going to throw an exception. So what we're going to do to turn this into a guard clause is reverse the logic. So instead of testing the positive condition, we're going to test the negative condition at the very top of the method. That looks like this. If it's not a string, or the string length is not equal to 36, we're going to throw this invalid argument exception. Now, we could debate whether throwing an invalid argument exception is uh, appropriate or not, but this is code that we, we pulled out of our system, so we're just dealing with it right now. You'll notice now that I've gotten rid of that outer block. So it's already a little cleaner for me, anyway, to read this and say, when I call find, if I don't pass in a string that is 36 characters in length, which we'll get to that in a second, then it's going to throw an invalid argument exception. Otherwise, it's going to process and do what I expect. So this is already better. But it's just one small step. The second refactoring we can look at is complicated, complex, or Boolean expressions that use magic numbers or otherwise non-obvious conditionals. So this is talking about when you have, I've seen, I've seen chains of five or six conditional Boolean expressions that are put in an if statement that says if this or this and parentheses, all of these things. Reading that is terrible. That's something that is very difficult at, for, at a glance to know what's going on. So you have to spend your time reading your code instead of writing your code. So when you have these situations, you should refactor them. You should pull those conditionals out into a helper method that's going to make it more explicit what exactly you're testing, what case you're testing. In our case, I happen to know that that is string ID and string length equal to, it needs to be 36, means that we use a string identifier, probably a UUID or something, that's 36 characters in length, and that it represents a valid ID. Now, most likely, this is a condition that we'll test in more places than just our find method, so extracting it will probably be helpful to other people. What if the rules change? So 36 is no longer our magic number, it's now 32 or 300, whatever. So extracting that out now makes this sentence, if you want to call it that, read a lot better. It says, if not, this is valid ID. So if the, val if the ID passed in is not valid, so the exception. So now we've, we've done a little refactoring, and I've done a little slide refactoring. This is one of my favorites, which is the SNP. I wouldn't do that protection code. Probably not a good idea. Uh, but we've now refactored this, so now it reads a lot easier. If I look at the, the full, full body of my method now, I see find takes an ID. If it's not valid, it throws an exception. Then it does all of this nonsense, which I haven't even broken into yet. So now I've got this. I run my tests. They pass, hopefully. Hopefully they pass. No, they do. I totally tested that. Uh, so refact the, sec the next refactoring we're going to look at is extract things that can be common functionality, or even functionality that you think should belong somewhere else. So this is a big one. And this, is, this word extract is probably the primary thing that you're going to hear when you talk about refactoring. 
In fact, there's uh, another a gentleman has a talk called Extract Till You Drop, which goes over uh, writing tests for code and going through and making refactoring. So if you, I think there's a video of it online. It's on YouTube or something. I think his name is uh, Matthias. I, I'm not really sure, but check. It. You can find it. I'll probably tweet about it if you, uh, if you want to check it out. But uh, it's, it's a decent introduction to writing tests for code that exists and refactoring it. But extracting, it's called extract till you drop the talk. That's, that's why I'm re uh, referencing it. But extracting things is going to be a primary effort that you're going to do when you're trying to refactor code into more clean things. We've already seen an example of this with taking that, uh, taking that conditional out that was extracting some logic. But in this case, if I look at, if I look back at my code, uh, if I look back at my code here, I'll see that inside this find method and the account service, I'm querying a database and returning data based on an ID. Now, two things kind of are talking to me about that piece of, about that segment of code there. The first one is, this is probably not a unique op operation to a find method. Most likely another method in this particular account service may want to find data about a particular account by ID. And the second thing is, my account service is directly querying a database. It could be okay, depending on what you're writing, or it could be very terrible. So I'm gonna flag this in my mind as something that I wanna look at, and I'm gonna go ahead and just extract it into a method. So here I extract it into a method inside that class called fetch account data by ID, and all I'm doing inside here, and the only thing I've actually changed about the logic is I'm returning an empty array uh, here explicitly, so instead of just returning uh, null or, or letting fetch not get, to the, uh, not get to the actual fetch, I'm returning an empty array. So now, when you ask this method uh, for an account data by an ID, it's gonna either give you the data you expected or an empty array. So plugging that into our method, we now say, after we validate the ID, we wanna fetch the data using our method. If it's empty, we wanna return null. Otherwise, we wanna build this account and return it. So now the flow has kind of improved a little bit. Now we've, we see three, three distinct things that can happen when we pass in or when we call this function. We get an exception, we get a null, or we get an account. These are the three things that should happen, so we should at least have those three test cases in place. If we don't, now's a good time to go do that. So our refactoring has taken us this far and given us uh, a, much more, a much more readable uh, piece of of code. So the next thing I want to do is, or the next refactoring that I'm going to do is another extraction. If we look down here, we've got this uh, bit of logic that's creating an account based on a, an array of data. So again, this is something that I'm going to look at it and see, well, this is probably something that another method in this class could use, or something that isn't unique to the find method, and it's not immediately obvious to me what's going on here. Well, it is in this case, but it may not be, depending on how verbose it is setting up an account and that sort of thing. But in our example, we're gonna extract this into a helper method that our, that our other methods on this account service can use to create an account. So we simply call it build account from data, pass in our data, return null if it's empty, return the account, build and return the account. And so now our original find method reads, if it's not valid, if the ID is not valid, throw an exception, get the data from, get, fetch some account data from a data source of some type, and then build the account from the data that we fetched. So now this is telling us explicitly what's going on. So another type of refactoring that is sometimes controversial. Uh, some people like this, some people absolutely hate it. So I'm going to give an example of it and you get to decide whether you like it or hate it. But in, in, uh, in, a, in a refactoring book or in the book refactoring, he talks about the idea of a null object. Now, uh, this is something you typically see in PHP because we're used to dealing with null checks. But if you look at client code for our account service, you'll see that we create our account service, then we call, uh, oh, this should be fine, I think. But we call account service find, and then we immediately have to do a null check. 
every single time we call the find or the fetch method, as it says here, every single time we call this, we have to do a null check. Why do we have to do that? Because it will return null if the account doesn't exist, or the account, or that ID is tied to more than one uh, user for some reason. So it's going to return null. So we have to always check this. So every piece, every place in our application that deals with an account from this particular method has to do a null check. That can get kind of ugly, and that can be something that can be easily forgotten. So remember, we want things to be simple. We want our interface to be simple. So how do we deal with that? Well, in refactoring, it talks about the idea of creating a null account. So this is an account object. It implements the interface or extends the account or some, some way of making a null account identify as an account. But it doesn't do anything. So it, it's basically returning nulls for properties. It's, in this case, it's set all, always to be inactive. So this is something you'll have to tease out of your particular application if you're going to do this, if you're going to undertake this refactoring. But it does clean things up a little bit because now, instead of doing a null check every time we call a find, we can simply use our account object and it should behave exactly as we expect. We call is active. It returns false. We handle that appropriately. So now our, uh, our actual uh, build account from data method, all it does instead of returning null is return a null account. So the final step that I've identified in this, in this code, and we talked about this earlier, is extracting behavior or extracting, extracting logic or behavior that belongs in a different class into a different class. So in our case, the behavior is this fetch account data by ID. In my opinion, it doesn't really belong in this account service. Depends on how, compl how, how complicated your application is. It could live there, that's fine. But maybe I don't want it to. Maybe I want to share a data access object of some type to abstract it out of the service and into a third place or a second place. So I'm going to extract this method from account service and put it into an account data provider. So now this, this object uh, will probably implement some interface that probably is called account data provider. So we'll probably rename this at some point. But in this case, we're extracting it. So now this interacts with PDO. So what this buys us is places that, are no, that we're calling the database. Now they don't have to be refactored if we change where our data comes from or how our data is, uh, is retrieved. We just have to create a new data provider for it, pass it in, and we're good to go. So extracting this fetch by ID method now requires us to make a slight change to our find method, which just says data this provider fetch by ID. But our advantage now is here's what our code looks like. Our null object now allows us to simply use an account, and we're now passing in an account data provider, so it's very explicit here what's going on. So this, this particular data provider is, could be named account data provider PDO or something to that effect. So now it's very explicit where the data is coming from. It's very explicit how we interact with our um, object. So I'm going to ask you, which one of these two methods is more readable? Which one makes more sense to you? This first one or the second one? Who says the first one? Nobody. Second one? Some people? It makes a little more sense. So this is taking it to a bit, it could be considered taking it to a bit of an extreme. Because now I can't read this and figure out all the return values from here based solely on looking at code. Now I have to know what this, what this uh, build account from data returns. I have to know that it returns a, a null account. But I don't really, because remember, it's type hinted against account. So I know now I get, I get an exception thrown or I get an account. That's all I care about. That's what comes out of this method. Now, I learned another thing, besides programming is hard, I learned that often Two examples are better than one. Now, this next example that we're going to go through is an actual refactoring that I did. I've changed some variables uh, around to protect the guilty parties. But uh, it's actual code that I have changed. Now, I know you're not going to be able to read this. I did this purposely. This is what this method looks like. It's a method on a, on a class called product. And it's called create URL. So if we look at it, basically what it's doing is we've got this first if block. So we've got two, two branches. We've got an if statement that says, if the store is not the default store, I want you to do all of this work. So 
Inside here, we're checking for a feature toggle. We're uh, building up some sort of URL, depending on if that feature is toggled or not. We're including a domain or not including a domain. Just kind of depends. Not really sure what that's all about. Uh, and then we've got an else block, which deals with this, the non-default store, so a different type of store. And in this one, we're, we're, we're toggling the feature, so we're building up a, a URL, and, and we're doing very similar work in here. So uh, when I first saw this, uh, come come through. I immediately my this is not dry sensor kind of triggered, and I said this is this is very terrible. I'm not going to want to read this in six months to try to figure out why this URL is written this way or why this method is written that way. So the the thing you have to do when you're trying to attempt a refactoring on code that has all these branches and that sort of thing is you just have to pick somewhere to start. There really isn't a right answer. It depends entirely on the code. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the, one of the deepest uh, conditionals that I can and start there. So this is something that I like to do. It helps me figure out where I am in the code. So in this case, I'm going to trace down. I'm going to see I've got an if statement, then an if statement, then an if statement, and then I'm, I'm done. So I'm going to start here. So this if include domain. And I happen to notice that it's also down here in this else block. And it's probably somewhere else uh, in the rest of the method. So I'm going to start right there. What I'm going to do is extract all the logic from that method. And what that looks like is now, instead of being nested inside those other if-elses, I now have one if include domain. So if we pass in a parameter include domain, I want to do all of this stuff. And basically, all I've done here is copied and pasted stuff, moved it up in my file so that it all fits and added the proper conditionals to match the same exact logic that we had before. So you'll still see store is default, so that was our original test. And then we'll see feature toggle information in here. So we're actually switching on the feature toggle as well. So I haven't really improved the code, because now I've made the method this many lines longer. Well, not quite that many. But I've I made the method longer now. So now it's even harder to figure out what's going on. But that's OK. Remember, this is incremental. This is not something that you do in one single step. So what I would do is write this, or do this, copy paste, run my tests. They still pass. I can continue on with my work. So now I need to look for something else to change to make this segment a little more readable. If I look, if I look through this, uh, this particular uh, if block here, so this if include uh, domain block, it strikes me that the protocol really seems to be something that's, that's repeated in several places. So I've got this secure protocol, secure protocol. I'm building a URL using it. And then I'm building a different URL here. So that's something that I'm going to want to, to move. So I look at it, and I figure out that it's really switching based on the feature toggle. So in this case, this feature toggle says use the secure protocol, otherwise use HTTP. The second one uses the secure protocol, or it does something else that we'll have to deal with later. But I'm going to start with the feature toggle switching of the protocol. So what I do is I move the original definition of my uh, protocol out. So this is the default. Uh, in this case, the default is we want to use the secure protocol. Then I look at my three instances of using it, and I change them. So instead of accessing the secure protocol here, I access. I just use the protocol variable. So now I've just defaulted it. I've changed. I haven't really changed anything. I've just moved a variable. Run my test. Still pass. I'm confident. So I didn't look a little harder. Now if we look at this, you'll see a little bit of of duplication of what's going on here. So we're basically appending a protocol to a domain name of some sort. So the, the second thing I noticed is not only is this duplicated, but we've also got this URL that the protocol just changes when the feature is toggled off. So in this case, I know that the protocol should always be secure protocol unless the feature is toggled off. So I can deal with that, and I can change this code a little bit by turning it into a a guard clause, essentially. And here's what that looks like. I've now reversed the logic. So instead of an else statement, it's now a negation of that original if, if condition. So if it's not a feature toggle, or if the feature toggle is not enabled, I want to switch the protocol to ACP. Then I want to return my, my URL, or I want to append protocol uh, domain name to my URL. Run my test. They're going to pass. Now I want to clean up how we're using protocol. So I look at this, this particular 
uh, block of code now, how it looks. And I notice that this domain name concept is kind of repeated. So I see I've got a domain name inside the default store. And then I've got this second domain name inside the non-default store, some other type of store. Uh, and it doesn't, it's not really important to separate them in this, in this way. So what I want to do is the same concept, the same refactoring. I want, I want to move a default. I want to make a same default for domain name and then change it based on the conditions. So we'll explore what that looks like. In this case, what I do is I make an a, a, a if statement all right, I move my domain name information up here. So I now moved this, I've extracted this information from my two uh, if uh, blocks below. And I set a default of the store domain name. That's the final value that was set earlier, if you remember. And then I say, if it's the default store, I actually need to change it. So instead of my store domain name, I want to use uh, the domain name that's in the config. And if that doesn't exist, uh, it should return null. So I want to use this thing called desktop domain name. This is all logic that exists in my code for some reason. It probably makes sense to somebody, maybe not me. Uh, but now I've, now what I've done is uh, I'm, I'm do, I see now that I'm duplicating this store is default uh, test here. So the, I have to figure out why that's happening and whether I should get rid of this brace and this particular line here, and then I can just have one flowing block. But I, I want to look at it and figure out why. Let's roll up a, this condition here. So I'm going to roll up a condition into a single uh, clause. And what that looks like is now I've decided right here, we say if store is default, and then immediately inside that we're switching the protocol. So I don't really need this to be nested in this way. What I can do is roll it up together and say if the store is default and the feature is not toggled, change the protocol to HTTP then hit my URL. So the difference that we see here is I've moved this outside and I've collapsed this particular if statement. So that change makes it a little more obvious what's going on. If I read down through my code, I see that I'm setting a default protocol. If I want to include the domain name, I'm going to do some stuff. And then I'm going to say, I need to change it to HTTP if that feature is not toggled and I'm on the default store. So that, that's more readable to me. Makes sense. So I run my tests and continue looking for places that I can uh, deal with or I can improve this particular piece of code. The, the next thing that I notice about this particular code is this URL dot equals protocol dot domain name and then URL dot equals protocol dot domain name, it's repeated. So I can probably combine these somehow in a similar way that I just, I just did. So if I look at this, I need to run this, this particular line, and then I need to collapse these conditionals into a single expression. I can start that process by simply negating uh, my feature toggle. So instead of if the feature is toggled, run that same line that I just ran. I'm just going to say if the feature is not toggled, I want to get my full URL. So now I've, I'm dealing with my special case here. And then in similar ways, I can now combine them into a compound expression to make it make a little more sense. In doing this, I also realized that I messed up this particular condition, which my test probably should have caught for me. But you'll notice I'm not specifying this try SSL uh, parameter. So I had to move it inside here. So this caught a bug that might have been introduced if I hadn't been doing this process. So now I moved down. I moved down the line. So I'm now moving to this block here. Because I, I, I'm a little happy. I'm happier with what this particular block at the top looks like. So I'm going to move down a little further. The next block of code, I've got the same problems that I just dealt with. I've got these feature toggles, and uh, I've got these else statements. But if I look at it, I can see that uh, I can see that I can probably shuffle this this logic around a little bit. So in this case, I've, I'm testing if the store if the store is not the default, and then I'm testing inside if the feature is toggled. I'm doing the same thing down here. So what I want to do is I want to I want to switch how that's happening, and I want to test first for the feature toggle, then deal with it. So I can bring all the code that happens when the feature is toggled together, and all the code that happens when the feature is not toggled together. That will help me understand what's going on a little better. So making that change, which it's a very subtle change, but making that change, I now see my original condition is: is this feature toggled? If it is, 
If it's not the default, I want to use this particular URL. If it is, if it is the default store, I want to use this particular URL. And what I notice, and what I gain by, by doing that, by switching how those conditionals work, is I now see that this doesn't really matter. It doesn't depend on whether the store is default or not. All it cares about is, is the feature toggled. This code is duplicating this code, and this code is duplicating this code. So the URLs are the same. So now I can reduce this to these lines right here, and then I moved the dated stuff out. So essentially all I've done is taken these lines and moved them inside this if uh, feature toggle, else do this, and then moved the date stuff, the date parameter stuff out. So now, instead of being inside my feature toggle, it's moved out into its own little uh, clause here, which I think makes it a little more readable what's going on. So my, my final bit uh, of information here, uh, or, or my, my final uh, bit of refactoring that I want to do, is I look here and I see this, uh, this domain name information is it's kind of cluttering up my logic. So it's cluttering up my flow. Like I don't really care about where it gets a domain name from when I'm reading this code. All I care is that it finds it or that it has a domain name. So I'm going to extract this into a helper method. All I do is create a helper method, copy and paste that code. So now instead of, instead of me trying to figure out what's going on here. So reading this, it says domain name equals from the config, get the store domain name. Otherwise, otherwise if, it's the, if it's the default store, I want to use a domain name. Otherwise, a desktop domain. That's not really telling me a lot of stuff. That's very difficult for me to read and understand. And six months from now, I'm probably not going to know why I wrote it that way. So I want to make it explicit. Why did I write it that way? Well, I wrote it that way because I have to figure out the domain name for a particular store. For the store that was passed in, I need to figure out what its domain name is. So now my method, my helper method here, tells me exactly what's going on. I'm getting a domain name for a store. So that was refactoring that method. It went from this abomination to this less of an abomination. There's still a lot of work that could be done to improve how it reads. But it now, the, now my, my, my story, if you want to call it that, my story is I want to create a, a, a URL for a particular product. So I check, do I want to include the domain? If I do, I do all this logic. If I don't, or even if I, I do, I want to then check, is the feature toggled? Depending on the feature toggle, I want to change my endpoint to slash checkout or slash resort detail. And then if the product is dated, I want to add some extra parameters. So now this, this reads a lot better. It tells me exactly what it's doing and why, as opposed to this one where I have to go through and have a bunch of clauses that tell me what's going on. So to recap, your code, the goal of any software developer should be to write code that is understandable and readable by human beings. This is clean code. Clean code is code that is readable by human beings. Clean code is something that's considered readable, cared for. It's something that you'll maintain. It's efficient, it's extensible, and it's simple. Your process of writing code should involve writing dirty code first and then successively refining the code that you write. So instead of, instead of taking on a refactoring project as a, a typical flow that I see is write my feature, release my feature, add a story in my backlog that says refactor. Instead of doing that, if you take the time as you're working on a feature to successively take, make incremental changes in your code, you'll be a lot closer to having clean code than you will of those stories that actually never get started. That's all I have. Uh, if you have questions, uh, that'd be great. Uh, just a second. Uh, joined in uh, is, a great, is, a, is a place to add some feedback for this talk. What did I do right? What, what was missing? What, what did you like? Uh, give me some information. Give me some feedback on what can be improved in this talk. Uh, it's the first time I've given it, so there's that. I will upload the slides. I haven't done so yet, but they'll be at speakerdeck.com slash Uh My Twitter handle is probably the best way to get in touch with me. It's jcaruth. I'm also on IRC frequently as jcaruth, so if you have follow-up questions after the fact or whatever, I'll be happy to, to answer them. So questions? Yes.
Yeah, so that, there's definitely a balance. So I wouldn't suggest going through a code base and changing everything into three line methods that just call 15 helper methods in a chain. I wouldn't suggest doing that. That's why I try to stress the importance of looking at code and is it something that can be reused or is it something that is not apparent what it's doing. So I would only extract things into helpers when the code isn't, uh, isn't obvious. So it's something that you can't look at immediately and say, oh, what that's doing is checking for a valid ID. You may know as a programmer or as a developer that's worked on a project for a long time, you may know that all IDs in your system are strings. They're all 36 characters. So looking at that original if statement that says, if this is a string and its length is 36, it's obviously an ID, makes perfect sense to you. But when I start at your company and I come in and I'm looking at your code and I'm like, why is this an invalid argument? I passed in what I thought was an ID. I passed in an integer or whatever and I got back this invalid argument, I would have to then go look at the code and say, oh, it's checking for that and try to figure it out as opposed to just reading, is this a valid ID? So there's, there's, a, there's a definite balance. I wouldn't, like I said, I wouldn't suggest going through and just refactoring for the sake of refactoring. There's a, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> I knew this would come up because, uh, it's, like I said, it's kind of a, something that a lot of people have a distaste for. Uh, he, he's asking about the benefits of using a null object versus just returning a null. The main benefit is your client code, the code that's using your code that you're writing, doesn't have to do null checks everywhere. So this is something that frequently comes up uh, in bug reports and errors that, that I see in our systems a lot is, Someone's done something, and for some reason they've gotten a null back, but they didn't do a null check. So there's now this fatal error that's going on because they're expecting an object to work as it did. A null object, as opposed to a null itself, just the value null, a null object has the same API, has the same exposed methods that you would expect from a, a concrete or a real object. So in our case, an account. So an account, if I check I'm probably going to be checking if it's valid, especially if I'm going to do a find and do something. I'll check, I'll check that. So my code now, my client code doesn't have to say, if it's null, report this error. It can just say, uh, if it's valid, do this. So now I don't have those two different statements going on. Does that, does that make sense? Basically, I say, I say uh, account service, find by ID this. It returns me null, the value. I now have to say, if null, do this. Then two lines down, I say, if account is valid, do this. With a null account, I can now just say, if account is valid or is not valid, do this. So now I don't have that extra bit of line that I have to both remember to do and have to uh, uh, deal with every time. So. Yeah, so from, from a testing perspective, that method returns an account already. That method was going through populating an account object. It was creating an account. So now I've changed it from returning an account or returning a null to just returning an account. It happens to be a null account, but my tests don't really have to care about that. I would probably write tests that say, that deal with that case to just make sure that my data that, that didn't match returns a null object or returns a null account. But now instead of having two return values, I have a single one. So in my opinion, that makes a lot more sense than always having to do null checks. But like I said, it's debatable. Different people have different opinions. Okay, so, yes, okay. So this question is, I said create a null account as opposed to just creating an account and then saying, is this valid? So calling that method is valid or whatever. And the reason I, I would advocate for a null account over just returning an account that is completely invalid is I don't like to 
be able to instantiate objects that are invalid. I, I don't want to create an object in an invalid state. Like to me, it doesn't make sense to have an account that says, hey, I am a concrete, I'm an actual account, but all of my data is empty. I don't have an ID, all of it's empty. So typically, I probably wouldn't have a method that says is valid on my models, on, a, on, a, on an object like an account. But just for simplicity's sake, I used an example. Does that make sense? Yeah, um, it may not be, it, it depends. So I've seen uh, in, in user accounts, he's asking if a, an anonymous user is a null account. So some people would implement it that way. Uh, some people would give a, an anonymous user a, a different set of functionality. So maybe instead of returning an you know, ID that's null, it may return an ID that just says guest or so, something, something to that effect. Like it's got some way of identifying it as different from a null account. So some people do with that. You could use a null account. It just depends on what you're, what you're doing. I knew that was going to bring a lot of questions. Uh, anybody else? Who's going to go home and write some clean code? Who's going to go home and refactor some stuff? Come on. You know you want to. All right. Good. All right, thanks. I'll be up here if you have any other questions.